Do you know where you were when you heard that Stevie Ray died in a helicopter crash? What about the Leonard Skinner tragedy? Or if you're really old, the day the music died. We're gonna investigate the crash of a recording star you might not have ever heard of, but I certainly know exactly where I was when I got the news that a twin Cessna with 12 people aboard had crashed with no survivors. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and this is an accident investigation video for taking off. I do these so that we can learn from them and make us better pilots, better people. 20 to 30 second flight on a hot Texas July evening resulted in four adults and eight children dead. The plane was a 1973 Cessna 414 straight with a Robertson stole kit. That's a seven seater for those keeping score at home. So there, there's never been a mystery about what happened here. 12 people on a seven seater on a hot day. But it's a plane crash that rocked my 17 year old world, like maybe Lennon's death did to some of you. You see, I'm a Christian. I grew up listening to Jesus music of the 70s. Keith Green was one of the pioneers of Jesus rock, had the piano stylings of an Elton John with the uncompromising lyrics of a prophet from God. Keith was from the LA area and almost made it as a child singer, but Donny Osmond was chosen instead. And in his teen years, he sought answers in drugs and the hippie movement of the late 60s and early 70s. He met his wife, Melody, and they both heard about Jesus, but fought it. It took a year of wrestling before he surrendered. And when he did, it was 110%. And this was a guy whose amp didn't even stop at 11. It had a 12 setting. Who gets that reference? And as his music and ministry grew throughout the mid to late 70s, they needed space and bought a ranch in East Texas that had a gravel landing strip that was maybe 3,500 feet long. Keith was a force of nature, an extreme A-type personality that even his friends wrote they had to take him in small doses. He was intense. In his short career, he made a huge impact in the Christian music business when he decided that as a ministry, it was wrong to charge for albums. He quit the label, made records that he gave to any for whatever they could afford. I tell you all this because I think it's relevant to the dynamics on that hot day in July in Texas. Keith Green was gearing up for some concert crusades that summer, 1982. So he and his organization, Last Days Ministries, had two planes. One was November 110 Victor Mike, a Cessna 414 twin engine. Friends of Keith and Melody were moving from LA to the East Coast to pastor a church. John and Dee Dee Smalley had six children. Keith and Melody had three with the recent news, number four was on the way. Keith wanted to show the family the ranch from the air, so he promised them all a plane ride. So in the early evening of July 28, 1982, Keith sent word to pilot Don Burmeister to get the 414 ready. Don was a former Marine aviator, having left as a captain. He was transitioning from the military and into the civilian world. And yes, the pilot is ultimately responsible, but in the military, you have loadmasters and others who deal with things like weight and balance of an aircraft. I've looked and researched and really just can't find information on Don. I don't know what kind of man or pilot he was. Was he a pushover in awe of Christian music star Keith Green, eager to please? I just don't know. But what we do know is that Don was new to this plane. He had 59 hours in it and all but two as a co-pilot. So he had like two hours as pilot in command, two. He went on a check ride a couple months before this to remove the center line thrust restriction that was on his multi-rating. It's common for pilots coming out of the military. But the FAA designated examiner he tested with shortly after the check ride had his certification removed for incomplete and inadequate examinations. So we don't know if the examiner questioned Don on weight and balance issues. And finally, the owner operator of the plane, Last Days Ministries, was required by their insurance to have certain training levels and familiarization met before anyone could be the pilot command. Don had not completed the training yet. So Keith took two of their three children, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and John and Dee Dee Smalley, with John being described as a giant of a man, and their six kids, a 12-year-old, uh, two seven-year-olds, two four-year-olds, and a three-year-old. Maybe Don equated three small children to be equal to one adult. But regardless, there weren't enough seats or seat belts. And with full tanks, he was 450 pounds overweight. And the center of gravity was over four inches aft of the limit. 
The 414 was configured as the pilot and co-pilot seat up front, a thin bulkhead with then two rear-facing seats, then space with the door in the mid-left, then two forward-facing seats, and beyond that was a seventh seat that had a cushion and the toilet underneath. At 7.20 p.m. local time on July 28, 1982, Don Burmeister taxied down the end of the runway and started. He rotated about 2,000 feet down the runway and climbed at a nose-high attitude. It struggled. The plane oscillated violently two or three times in the pitch access. Don was fighting the yoke and fighting the control of the plane that was nose-high. This is a satellite picture about 12 years after the accident. The Greens lived in this house. The runway starts not too far away. It's 3,500 feet to that little clearing and fence. After that, another 1,500 feet of open field before the 30-foot trees. The plane rotated at this point, and then for about 4,000 more feet, it struggled until hitting those trees. As someone who has been a huge fan of the music, this crash has always been something I've been curious about. But the NTSB conclusions are pretty straightforward. 12 findings, seven of them on the pilot, two of them on last day's ministry as the operator, one on the FAA about the examiner, and one on the trees, and one on the fire. The bottom line, pilot Don took off 450 pounds overweight, balance exceeding aft limits, resulting in the collision with 30-foot trees, consequent explosion, and fire. I've talked to some 414 experts because I want to know what I can take away from this accident and discovered some interesting things. I've always thought the weight was the big issue, but where were they seated? Don would have been up front on the left. Did he put a child or two up front in the other seat? One thing that has been said is that big John Smalley was in that aft seventh seat. And that's what one expert pointed to. He owned a 414 for a long time with tons of hours. And the 414 had a lot of power. He feels that even with that warm air, he could have flown the plane 450 pounds overweight over those trees. What about you pilots? Do you agree? Leave your comments. But the reports were that the plane on rotation and for the duration of the short flight was in that nose high attitude. And for those non-pilots, Here's the deal. It's human nature that on takeoff and something isn't right, you want to raise that nose away from the earth. Something's wrong. I got to get away from the ground. But airplanes can stall at any speed and you hasten the stall if you keep increasing that angle of attack. What Don needed to have done, besides the obvious, don't take off, is right as he rotated to push that yoke back towards the ground and let it build up some speed and ground effect and then pitch to get over those trees. But what he did was fly that nose-high attitude, trying to pull himself out of a bad situation. Also, you non-pilots, I mentioned something called ground effect. When a plane is flying extremely close to the ground, like in the moment right after takeoff, or right before landing when the wheels are about to touch the ground, the air that's deflected under the plane can increase air pressure on the lower wing surface, which gives you a little bit more lift. The ground effect is usually at or below about half of the aircraft's wingspan. So a 40-foot wingspan, like in this case, means its effect is up to about 22 feet above the ground. Another thing to know for you non-pilots, when your plane is heavy in the back, it can be harder to control or maneuver. That small back horizontal control surface, you might call it a small wing, we call it the elevator, is also producing lift like the main wing but its lift is actually downward. And with an aft center of gravity, Don had what's called a light stick force, meaning the yoke didn't take hardly any effort. In this condition, and you're not ready for it, you'll pull back at rotation and it's lighter, and you pull back too far and too quick. And of course, that contributes to the stall as well. And that's where the center of gravity past the limits to the rear of the plane heavily contributed to the problem. While the stick would be light, the airplane would also be hard to control with that aft center gravity. And it's totally against human nature to push down and fly closer to the ground. The inclination is to keep pulling up to get the airplane in the sky. But pushing down, staying close to the ground, would have enabled the plane to gain some speed and then pull up before the trees when it was faster. So I believe the biggest factor in this crash was not the overweight, but the aft center of gravity. Weight and balance are terms Pilots use almost as one word, weight and balance. We measure, we weigh our baggage, and if it's under, we load it up. I don't think 
enough thought goes into balance. Maybe that's because that's where heavier duty math comes in and I'm a liberal arts major. But fortunately in this day and age, I have four flight and it does the number crunching for me. But a pilot needs to know how to calculate the center of gravity and understand what moments are and what the arm is. And I'm not teaching that in this video. You need to go look it up if you're wondering. Some people have talked about that it's too bad the fuel ignited and exploded, that maybe they'd have walked away. The plane hit 30 foot tall trees. That's not very high. But don't forget, people were not belted in and they were going around 80 miles an hour, most likely. The 414 has a very strong cabin and there's a chance, but it was still a very bad situation. I don't agree with people who speculate they might have walked away. After hitting the 30 foot trees, the plane continued for another 150 feet into the woods before the scraping tanks caught fire and exploded, killing four adults and eight children. Melody gave birth to a daughter seven months later and continued the last day's ministry even to today. They do important work and through the years I've supported them at times. Check them out and I'll put a link there in the description. In the military, pilot Don Burmeister had people who handled the loading, but that's no excuse. He was 100% responsible. Why did he do it? Couldn't he have done two sightseeing trips and taken half at a time? Did Keith push him towards doing it all in one trip? I mean, sunset wasn't too far away. Maybe they couldn't get another flight in. I think he may have never been in this level of trouble. He was flying jets in the military. There was very little that more power couldn't solve. He didn't have enough experience in piston engine aircraft. Did he wonder about the weight and balance? Here's another interesting side note. Keith Green was very black and white, in your face type personality. But a couple of years after the accident, while in college, I interviewed another Christian artist for a public access show, remember those, who had spent some time with Keith and said that Keith was extremely law-abiding, felt that it was what a Christian should be about, not one mile over the speed limit type of law-abiding. Yet last day's ministry, which he led, did not come even close to dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the management of this plane, specifically the requirements that the pilot in command had to have in order to fly left seat. That's puzzling to me. And this is where I take some things away to help me. And I know I can be a people pleaser. I know I can get starstruck. I know I want to be a hero in your eyes. Sure, I can stand here now and tell you I would never do what Don did. But what if my favorite celebrity was standing there asking me to do it, that the plane can handle a little overweight, you'd be a hero to me and these kids, would I give in? Man, I hope not. I really hope not. But I know I could, so I need to be aware of my ego that wants to please, to be the hero and fight it and kill it. What's sad here is that sometimes it takes an emergency for me to learn. I don't know about you, but case in point, one time early in flying my 210, I got close to a thunderstorm. And for a couple of very long minutes, I really thought this was it. The plane was gonna break up and I was going to die. Even ATC checked in on me several times to make sure I was still there. Since that episode, I've never, ever even gotten close to that, ever. Ain't gonna happen. And for some reason, my plane didn't break up and I didn't die, but I was just as stupid and could have. Don wasn't as fortunate. Had he cleared those trees and gotten airborne, I bet he'd never make that overweight FCG mistake again. But for the grace of God, there go I. Let's please not roll the dice but instead learn by the blood that's already spilt and not by shedding our own. Strive to really understand your plane, the system, the fundamentals of flight. Without it, your judgment could fail. You need all the information to make good judgment. One other takeaway. After the accident, the Smalley family sued last days and the insurance company wouldn't cover, understandably. It took a huge toll on the ministry at a time of grieving. And I wanna make sure that my insurance is current, that the requirements they have are met, for maintenance and training. And that as a pilot, I'm always current and flying within the regs. While most of you watching this consider another crash the day the music died, for me, the music died July 28, 1982. No wonder I've had a fascination with air crashes. And now that I've become a pilot, I understand more the physics of what happened. And for Christians watching, we know that God works all things for good for those of us who believe and are called according to his purpose. I don't have to have an understanding of all the good here, but that doesn't make it any less good. Remember, 
Superior judgment trumps superior skills like in this crash. That's all I have. Stay safe.